Right, hello everyone, and welcome to this session, which is, I believe, session four on metabolic and knowledge engineering. It's the second session of the day on this topic. Uh, today we have uh, in this session three talks. I believe the first one is a short talk and the others are more extended. Uh, so the first one should last, I believe, around 15 minutes and the other two about 25 minutes each, including questions. All right, so the first presenter is Tom Stoughton. He will be discussing the iBioSim server, which is a tool for improving the workflow for genetic design and modeling. Uh, Tom is a sophomore undergraduate student at the University of Colorado Boulder. He's studying computer science and computational biology. And the iBioSim server is a proposal for a dedicated server and an API to run the iBioSim application as a backend tool for simulating genetic circuit models from the web-based SBOL Canvas tool. So Tom, you can go ahead, share your screen, and can start your presentation. All right, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Um, as you said, my name is Tom Stoughton. I'm a member of the Genetic Logic Lab here at the University of Colorado Boulder. And our group has been working on the iBioSim server, which is a tool for improving the workflow for designing genetic circuits. Uh, quickly for some background, uh, genetic design automation is important to the field of synthetic biology because it allows researchers to uh, save time and effort when designing genetic circuits. Uh, genetic circuits are circuits that use cellular pathways and proteins of living cells to execute their functions. And because these are difficult to implement in vivo, it helps to be able to create uh, computational models of these circuits before their uh, attempts are made to actually build them in living cells. And with these computational models, software is very helpful for uh, creating them. So some of the software tools that have been developed already include SynBioHub, which is an online library of genetic parts, which are uh, DNA sequences that have a specific function within a cell. iBioSim, which is a downloadable application for the simulation and design of genetic circuits. And more recently, SVOL Canvas, which is the genetic circuit design tool uh, that is based online. With the development of these software tools uh, comes a need for them to be able to communicate with each other. So a set of standards has been developed. Um, these standards include SBOL, which is the synthetic biology open language that encodes genetic parts, uh, SBML, which is the systems biology markup language, which encodes computational models of genetic circuits, SETML, which is the simulation experiment description markup language, which encodes simulation setups um, and uh, arguments for experiment repeatability, and the Combine Archive, which is just a set of all of the previous types of files that is necessary to completely reproduce a simulation study. Um, a generic workflow has uh, formed for the development of uh, designing genetic circuits and modeling them and then simulating them. And it generally looks like this. It starts with the uh, retrieval of genetic parts from SynBioHub, which can be done through SBOL Canvas, where then the user can design their genetic circuit. Then using the virtual parts repository, uh, specific proteins are assigned as inputs and outputs to the genetic circuit. And then um, the SBOL file is imported into iBioSim, where the model conversion uh, converts the SBOL into SBML, creating a computational model of the genetic circuit. Then the user can decide uh, arguments for how to simulate the genetic circuit computational model, such as uh, the number of runs, the simulation algorithm, and um, other, other specific arguments. And then the iBioSim can simulate the, simulate the computational model, generating um, files for each of the individual runs, graphs of the general behavior of the computational model, and finally, a setML file to reproduce the simulation. All of these files can then be sent back to SynBioHub where they can be shared with the community and checked by other researchers. This workflow currently does have a few flaws though, in that um, it requires the user to switch back and forth between different applications, between SBOL Canvas and iBioSim. And it requires a user to import and export SBOL files and SBML files between applications. Uh, the, the goal of our research has been to try and eliminate this needless switching between applications and exporting of files and to generally create a 
more straightforward workflow for users. So our proposed workflow has the same first two steps, the retrieval of genetic, genetic parts from SymbioHub and the design of genetic circuits in SVL Canvas, but it implements a Dockerize API to take over the enrichment modeling and eventually the simulation steps um, in order to keep the user on SVL Canvas the whole time, allowing them to not need to switch between iBiosim and SVL Canvas. The long-term goal for this project is for this API to be able to accept an SPL file as input, along with arguments for uh, how to simulate it and how to complete the enrichment and modeling steps, and then have the API execute these commands on the back end using um, iBioSim running on a server, and then return the results back to SPL Canvas, eventually rendering the simulation on SPL Canvas. Um, this workflow makes use of the Combine Archive to help package all of the files together and keep everything more organized. Uh, this workflow also, uh, this workflow utilizes the um, simulation capabilities of iBioSim while removing the need to download an external application and uh, switch back and forth between these applications dealing with different user interfaces and eventually uh, importing and exporting files will uh, not be required. As for how this API was implemented, our group used a Python API running on a Docker container that will eventually be kept up and running on a server. Um, an API is an application programming interface that uh, is essentially a application that runs behind a web page. So in this case, the API would be running behind SVL Canvas. And a Docker container is a type of virtual environment that is used to contain and run applications that allows it to be um, updated externally much easier. And as for how we handled uh, receiving HTTP requests, which is the main uh, communication between SVL Canvas and this API, we use the Python Flask library. As for how this API actually works step-by-step, step, it starts by receiving a combine archive through and as the body of an HTTP request, along with all of the arguments for how to simulate the uh, combine archive. Then the script starts to build the command in order to run the iBiosim executable file that is able to actually simulate the combine archive. So it starts by the name of the executable file, then the name of the archive, and then all of the flags and arguments for how to simulate it. Next, the script runs the simulation and collects the output files into a temporary directory. And then these output files are then zip packaged into a zip file and returned to SVL Canvas or as a response to the HTTP request. After this step, uh, the temporary directory is deleted and the API is ready to receive another combine archive. What our API is actually able to accomplish is uh, it is able to receive an HTTP request with a combine archive in the body. Um, it's able to simulate this combine archive correctly and then send the results back as a response to the HTTP request. For the purposes of testing this API, um, it is currently only able to accept combine archives as input as opposed to SVL files as specified in the proposal workflow. And this is because uh, Combine Archives hold uh, previously hold all of the data for previously run simulations. So we were able to test that the simulations are being run correctly. Um, but this also means that uh, we aren't able to yet accept SPL files as input. Also, uh, since SPL Canvas has not yet been implemented uh, to be able to send these HTTP requests, uh, we used a, an API development tool called Postman in order to send these requests. Uh, in the future, as I said before, uh, we would like this API to be able to accept SPL files as input as well as combine archives so that first time simulations can be run. And this involves uh, implementing the SPL to SVML conversion aspect of iBioSim into the API as well as the simulation aspect. And in addition, we need to implement, implement the uh, interface for SPL Canvas in order to send the correct HTTP request along with the body with the correct files uh, to allow for seamless front-end simulations. 
Next, we need to we would want to add model designing features to SBOL Canvas to allow for more complex computational models to be formed without needing to use iBioSim directly. And finally, we would need to test the API uh, for robustness to see if it is able to run on a server. I would like to acknowledge the University of Colorado Boulder and the Summer Program for Undergraduate Research, along with the Genetic Logic Lab, the Engineering Excellence Fund, and the National Science Foundation along with all of the members of the Genetic Logic Lab for helping me throughout this project. I'd now like to take this time for any questions. Feel free to ask questions directly by unmuting your microphone or you can place them on the chat and I can read them. All right, there's a question. When a scientist is working on a design, there may be multiple versions that generate temporary files. Will you hold them temporarily? Um, so this sounds like in, uh, something that would be implemented for SBOL Canvas rather than the API. Um, the API is currently, the goal of the API is to have it take over the enrichment and simulation steps. But if a scientist is working on multiple versions of the same, uh, the same generic genetic circuit, um, they should be able to save multiple versions onto, yeah, of course I can switch back. Uh, they should be able to save multiple versions on SBOL, on SBOL Canvas and then, uh, yeah, implement those using the API. Did that answer your question? Okay, Prashant, I think he has a question. You want to go ahead? Um, yeah, actually, uh, along along this, uh, I, I guess it's probably a continuation of that question. But I, I guess if you did, if you're working with, let's say, multiple hypotheses mm -hmm. um, for the exact same design, though, that is, how, I mean, how is that uh, how is that stored basically? Because you could you could write basically one model, you're not okay with that, you may want to change it, you may want to change a hypothesis. So I'm kind of curious about that aspect. Yeah, this would be, um, again, implemented through SBOL Canvas. Um, the API is more of an automation tool for uh, just automatically completing these steps. And so all of the setups for generating these models would be decided in SBOL Canvas before these files are sent over to the API. I see. Okay, thanks. Well, Tom, I don't know if you're reading the comments directly. You were asked if you were being the gather session afterwards to follow up. Uh, yeah, I will be. Cool. I also have a question. It seems to me that some of the effort made here is to uh, consolidate the pipeline and be able to control it. Uh, so are there future steps involving actually being able to make the, the whole pipeline more programmable and slowly try to abstract it and make it at a higher level, like the control you have over it? Yeah, um, there definitely are future goals to be able to uh, really have specific things that SBOL Canvas can do to have it take over some of the things that iBiosim can do and really make it uh, specific and high level, as you said. Thank you. All right, I think the timing is good. Now to proceed with the next talk, uh, you can stop sharing now. Ah, and Chris Meyer said that maybe we should consider a plugin interface for this. All right, <laughs> sounds good. All right, so let me find, okay, the second talk, the second presenter is Yasmin Ahmed. And uh, Yasmin will be presenting a talk titled New Advances in the Automation of Context-Aware Information Selection and Guided Model Assembly. So Yasmin is also a PhD student at the University of Pittsburgh in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. And before joining Pitt, Yasmin received a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science from Cairo University in Biomedical Engineering. She's currently working in the Melody Lab at the University of Pittsburgh. 
Yasmin, you can go ahead and share your screen and present if you want. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Yasmin Ahmed. And today I will talk about uh, five tools that have been recently proposed to automatically assemble dynamic network models from information in published literature. So here's the outline of the presentation. Um, so assembling, uh, so creating models, computational models uh, for complex systems such as intracellular, intercellular networks would enable a better understanding of these systems. Moreover, extending existing models from new information uh, from different knowledge sources such as expert input databases and uh, pathway databases and literature uh, uh, is important to understand these systems. However, the, the, this task is a labor intensive task and it's time consuming and it's, uh, there's a pressing need to automate this process. Uh, and Recently, there, there has been a push in synthetic biology field to automate the process of the model assembly. And here's a typical model assembly pipeline that starts with a question raised by the user about the system under study. This question is transformed into a query in order to search um, and for the, the relevant papers. And then uh, we, inf we extract information in order to assemble models and then the assembled models will be an analyzed in order to see whether we've uh, answered the user questions. So to this end, the automation challenges are the machine reading issues, the literature inconsistency, the model validation difficulties and the providing precise and quick answers to users questions. So here is a, a manual model extension pipeline versus automated model extension pipeline. For the manual ex model extension pipeline, there's a baseline model that has been created manually. And then there are experimental data and observations. And from those two inputs, we can extract the new information or the new interactions that can be added to the baseline model. For the automated model extension pipeline, we have information extracted from literature and a baseline model. And then we have the model extension uh, module that will uh, assemble the most relevant information into the baseline model. Then we will analyze the assembled models uh, and then we'll find the best extended model. So here we'll talk about five recent tools that have been proposed in this direction, uh, namely accordion, clarinet, genetic algorithm-based method, fiddle layer-based method, so in this part of the presentation, I will talk about some background concepts that will help us to understand uh, or to, to understand the following slides. The first thing I will talk about the information extraction pipeline. So let's say we have this question that how is P10 regulation involved in T cell fate? So this question can be transformed into a search query such as T cell fate and uh, P10 regulation. That query would be input to search engines in order to extract the most relevant papers. And those papers would be input to machine reading engines in order to extract the uh, interactions that can be added to models. The second thing we we'll talk about the model representation that we are using. So let's say we have to, these two example sentences that are uh, that can be read by machine readers and then we have this tabular format from a machine reading engine that we use called reach so this tabular format we have for each row uh, an interaction and for the the information about this interaction the regulator name the regulated name and their type and id and the type of interaction whether it's activation or inhibition and the reference or the paper id from where the interactions have been extracted so we convert this tabular format from, uh, from reach to our by recipe format, which is an element-based format. So for each row, there is an element and its type and ID and the influence set or the set of positive and negative regulators of this element and the discrete levels. And here is the graphical representation of this uh, of these uh, interactions. So FOXP3 has been uh, actively is been uh, positively regulated by STAT5 and FAT and SNAP3, and it's inhabited by mTOR. So here I will talk about the first tool, which is a layer, which, which we named the layer-based method. So this method is a rapid and automated framework to extend self-signaling models using automated reading. 
and it helps scientists to assemble information from voluminous, fragmented, and inconsistent literature. So the, the authors in this paper, in this method, uh, proposed the concept of layers. So they organized the new information into layers based on their proximity to the baseline model, or the, based on their proximity to some key elements in the baseline model. And then they define some configuration based on which they assemble the, the, inf the new information and they see which ones uh, satisfy a predefined set of uh, properties that will, uh, so that, will, uh, that will say, they will tell us whether the system behavior is recapitulated or not. The second method is a genetic algorithm based method. And here is the, the, the framework, how the, the, the authors are assembling the new models. So they have the literature reading output as input and the baseline model. And then they use the genetic algorithm as a search engine, as a search tool to search for the most relevant interactions that can be added to the models. And then they simulate the models and test them against a predefined set of, of system properties. So the genetic algorithm, uh, I, the idea of using the genetic algorithm, you need to have to, to define two things, the gene code and, uh, and call a cost function. The gene code is basically the solution, your solution space. And the cost function is the function that you would use to test for the correctness of the assembled or the newly, add, uh, newly added extensions or new interactions. So the algorithm starts by assigning n individuals each individual is a subset from the extension or the new interactions and then uh, each individual is tested again is added to the baseline model and tested again uh, against a set of properties and then uh, the cost function is is used to uh, to evaluate an error if the error is zero then this individual uh, is a good candidate to be added to the baseline model if it's not zero it's then uh, the, these individuals will be will go to will evolve to uh, uh, using a genetic uh, operation either mutation crossover or reproduction to the next generation and then we try the next uh, generation and we we'll see which individual will result in a zero error and this one that results in a zero error will be a good candidate to be added to the design model. The third and fourth methods are accordion and clarinet and they are both graph based methods. So why do we use such graph-based methods in order to assemble new information into models, to test the newly assembled models, and to select the most suitable model to address user questions? So how this can be done using the clusters of strongly connected elements in the new information, and the new elements have, which new elements have impact on the model, and then we evaluate the performance of the assembled models. So, here, so here's an overview of accordion versus clarinet. So the graph structure of accordion you have for each, each node is an element such as protein or gene, and the edge is an interaction between elements such as activation or inhibition. Whereas for clarinet, the node is an interaction and there exists an edge between two interactions whenever uh, they appear or they occur in the same paper. For the evaluation of accordion, the, we test the system properties using stochastic simulation and statistical model checking. Whereas for clarinet, uh, we have different metrics, several metrics that uh, rely on the occurrence and co-occurrence of, uh, of uh, the interactions in literature, which we refer to as literature support. And also we, 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 clarinet uh, defines other uh, metrics that rely on the model support. So first, accordion. Accordion stands for automated clustering, conditional on relating data of interactions to a network. So this is a novel tool and methodology that automatically and efficiently assemble uh, information extracted from literature into models. So this is the pipeline of accordion. So given the extracted events and the baseline model, we extract the candidate extensions that will be uh, will be will, will construct our network. So the network will be uh, composed of the baseline model and the new extensions or the candidate extensions. This inference network of baseline model plus candidate extensions will be clustered and then each cluster will be added to the baseline model and form a candidate model. So we have n clusters and n candidate models that need to be uh, tested against a predefined set of system properties. And then these candidate models will be tested uh, using stochastic simulation and statistical model checking in order to rank the models and choose the best the best model that recapitulate the system behavior. 
So here is, I'm showing the uh, toy model for the, for how accordion operates. So we have the baseline model is basically a, a graph with the nodes uh, are the elements, the model elements, and the edges are the interactions between elements. And the candidate extension interactions is the new information. It's also a graph. So the union between this graph would form our network that will be uh, clustered in order to, to see which clusters will, uh, will be the most relevant information to the baseline model. So this graph shows us the baseline model and uh, the axes and y's are the new in information. So we form a network here and we cluster it. And let's say the clusters, the yellow and purple clusters are the results of clustering this network. So we first test whether these clusters are connected to the baseline model by introducing the concept of return path. A return path starts in the baseline model, goes through one cluster and then connects back to the baseline model. So we could find such paths between one cluster and the baseline model or multiple clusters in the baseline model as shown uh, in red. So for clarinet, uh, it's clarifying networks. Uh, it stands for clarifying networks, an efficient approach for informing dynamic network models with information from published literature. The functionalities of Clarinet are to select uh, the new relevant information and then to organize this information into a collaboration graph, which we call ECLG or event collaboration graph. And then Clarinet proposes several metrics that rely on the occurrence and co-occurrence frequency of interactions and on the connectivity of new interaction to the baseline model. So the, this is the pipeline of clarinet. It starts, it's, the inputs are the extracted events and the, and the baseline model. And from there, we get the extensions that are, uh, and from the extensions, we form the event collaboration graph where a node is an interaction and there is an edge between two nodes whenever they occur in the same paper. Then we, uh, we score each node based on the individu individual uh, assessment. Metric, and then we, uh, we, we, we score each pair of events or each pair of interactions based on this pair assessment metrics. And then we form a node, a node edge weighted graph that will be clustered. And then each cluster will be interpreted in order to be added to the baseline model. And before being added to the baseline model, we search for return paths between this cluster and the baseline model. And also we, we look for, uh, there's another metric that Clarinet is proposing, which is the node overlap between the cluster and the baseline model, and which represents another connectivity between uh, connectivity metric between the new information and the baseline model. So here are the literature support metrics. They are either individual assessment or pair assessment. For the individual assessment, this is for the node weights and the pair assessment for the edge weights. And for the model support metrics, we have either the node overlap with existing models and the return path. So here's a toy model. If we imagine that this is the, the, the candidate ECLG or event collaboration graph, where the nodes are the, are the interactions and the, the edges are between two, two interactions whenever they appear in the same paper. This ECLG will be clustered and the, those clusters will be interpreted in order to be added to the baseline model and see and rank the, the candidate model to see which model recapitulate the system behavior. The fifth tool is FIDDLE, which stands for finding interactions using diagram-driven model extension. This, tool, this methodology or tool employs two methods that rely on the uh, breadth first search algorithm and the depth first search algorithm that are network search algorithms. So these two methods, the, the authors call them breadth first edition and depth first edition. So this is a sample method that adds a sample method that adds one interaction at a time, then iteratively add the new interactions and then see whether the added interaction satisfy the system properties or not. The good thing about this uh, the, this uh, this tool is that it adds the it adds like it makes small changes to the model and then monitors the small change and then see whether this small change will, uh, will improve the behavior of the baseline model or not. Here is the, uh, the overview of the method. Again, the inputs are the candidate extensions or the candidate ages or the new information, and then the baseline model or the existing information, and then the expected model behavior or the system properties. 
the first step is to uh, simulate the baseline model and then and then compute a metric or, the, or an error metric called uh, the uh, the total model error and then from and then it be added, then the the authors add or fiddle adds uh, new interactions to the baseline model and then computes this total model error uh, for different candidate models based on the addition of this, of different interactions and then they rank the candidate models and then you, they will see which model is better than the baseline model based on its total model error metric. This process is iterative until they find a model that uh, enhances or improves the performance of the baseline model. So for the experimental setup, we use the PubMed database to select the papers and we use the reach engines to read the papers and automatically ext extract the candidate extension interactions. And then to evaluate the generated candidate models from the five tools, we use the dish simulator and the statistical model checking. And our case study is to automatically expand the dynamic uh, uh, naive T cell differentiation model. So the T cells are important in, to, to, in the cell mediated fate, and, and uh, the T cell differentiation model. So T cells are differentiated either to T helper cells that. Uh, that uh, activate the immune response or T regulatory cells that suppresses the immune response. So there is a computational model about the T cell differentiation that has been proposed in one. And the authors have proposed also uh, some key elements that are uh, best representative to the, the behavior of the, the computational model of the T cell differentiation. Those elements are the FOXP3 and IL2. So here's again the manual model extension versus the automated model extension. So we have the golden model from two, which is an extended version of the uh, computational model that has been proposed in one. So this will be our golden model and we will use the baseline model as the model that has been uh, created in one. And the golden model is the manually expanded version from this model. So you want to automatically expand this version and compare it to the golden model or the manually expanded model. So how to select the final extended model? We test each candidate model using statistical model checking, and we compute a probability estimate for each of the system properties. The system properties are basically the property of the uh, dynamic behavior of some key elements, such as the FOXP3 and IL2. And then we select the candidate model that best recapitulates system behavior or that uh, satisfies as many uh, properties as possible. So this is an example of uh, some interactions from the T cell differentiation model, and this is the dynamic behavior of FOXP3 and IL2 under three different scenarios. And this is how the properties look like uh, using the BLTL expressions, and this is the description of each of these properties. So here are the results, and we have the model checking probability estimates for the baseline model and the golden model and the five tools, the layer-based, the genetic algorithm-based according to Clarinet, and the, the two methods of the FIDL tool. So as we can see here, so here are the number of properties, there are 27 properties. We are testing the candidate model generated by each tool against 27 properties, and we are trying to see which, uh, which candidate model satisfies mo uh, most, most of the properties. So from, the, from this column, you can see how many properties uh, exceeds 0.85, which means it satisfies the properties with high probability. We'll find that genetic algorithm uh, performs the best. It's almost the same as the, the golden model. It satisfies 25 properties as the golden model. Uh, the clarinet and accordion uh, are pretty dissimilar to each other. And uh, the, the worst, the performance of Fiddle is poor due to the number, the low number of extensions added by Fiddle. So as a summary, the genetic algorithm-based extension increases with the number of possible extensions. So it, improve, it, it proves that we, from this case study, the genetic algorithm performed the best. However, it has some problems with non-determinism and it, it, uh, it cannot be applied to large-scale models. Uh, accordion and clarinet balance performance with scalability and can be applied to large-scale models. If the user is interested in a method that uh, relies the most on the interactions that are related to the baseline model, they can use the layer-based method. However, it's a bit uh, impractical with the large number of layers, if the, if the user is interested in large number of layers. 
And Fiddle is, uh, it can be used when uh, the user is interested in adding like small information and see the effect of the small information on the baseline model. Moreover, the, met the, the, the scoring metric or the, how they rank the, the candidate models is different. They don't use the statistical model checking while choosing the candidate model. So maybe as a future direction, we could uh, integrate the model checking with Fiddle to improve its, uh, its performance. So our conclusions and future work, so expanding models with information in literature automatically will allow for rapid collection of information in a consistent and comprehensive way, and it will facilitate information we use and better reproducibility. We described here five recent tools that are an early field software tools and that can replace hundreds or thousands of manual experiments. As our future directions, we are planning to apply these tools and to uh, improve our comparison using other models in different biological domains and we work on parallelization of model checking algorithm. And finally, I think we can integrate the model checking with the tools itself to improve the, their performance, such as Fiddle and model checking. And that's it. All right, thanks a lot, Yasmin. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, yeah, uh, let me just, ask uh, uh, out loud. Uh, so so out of the evaluation, um, the, the GA-based models, uh, you said performed the best. Uh, could you say what the absolute number was? So when you did the evaluation, how many uh, uh, comparisons you made? And so for the evaluation, as in how many models were there that you, um, that you tried to validate? Uh, so here we're not showing how many models, do you mean how many candidate models that the genetic algorithm uh, method has generated? Um, how many candidate, uh, so how many did you validate again? So there's, there's the number of candidates that it generates and then how many there are in, in your, in your comparison, right? So, yeah. Uh, so here we have, we have just one candidate, one model. That, mm -hmm. uh, that has 20, like that has 25 properties satisfied. But there are, for the candidate models that have been generated, there are a lot for, for the genetic algorithm because it tries like if we have n extensions or n new interactions, the user can put like n, uh, n, n iterations or the, the, so the stopping condition that can be put by the user because it's an iterative method. So they either okay. can put like an N or they say uh, when, when the error is zero, just stop. I see, okay. Um, okay, so, it's, but it's being compared against one model in this case, the-, the, the Yes, exactly, model. the golden model, okay. yes, exactly. So this is just one case study, which is okay. the cell differentiation computational model. Okay. I'm sorry, you may have said this in your, in your future work, um, are you, planning on expanding the, uh, the validation? Yes. So we are planning, so let's say for clarinet, in clarinet paper, we've been uh, testing the tool against three different models with different granularity. So they are of different sizes. And also the reading uh, output or the new extensions are from different sizes. And we explored like these different cases. So we say here that we, in the future, we want to compare all the five tools against different models of different scale, such yeah, as with yeah, yeah. Thanks. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I think um, it, it'll be very compelling when you uh, extend the comparison to uh, to many models. Um, I, I know it's difficult to establish that yeah. model because uh, you have to do that by hand first. But um, yeah, it, it makes sense to do so. Are there any other questions? Again, you can unmute your microphone and ask, or you can ask on the chat and I can read the question. All right, there are no further questions. Let's go back to the other talk because we are a little late on the schedule. So thank you again, Yasmin. All right. So the third presenter, actually is from the same lab, uh, is uh, Casey Hansen. And Casey will present a talk with the title Classifying Literature Extracted Events for Automated Model Extension. Uh, Casey is a bioengineering PhD candidate in the Melody 
uh, lab, which stands for Mechanism and Logic of Dynamics at the University of Pittsburgh. Okay, uh, sound-wise, I'm coming in clearly. Uh, yes? That's correct. Okay, fantastic. All right, um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work today. Uh, I think it's a really fun project and I'm excited to share it with you. Um, we are going backwards a little bit uh, compared to Yasmin's talk. Um, our talks kind of flow together in a way, um, but I'll also be talking about uh, automated model building. So to give, a, to kind of repeat some context, um, I'm going to be focusing on biological computational models. Um, and computational models are a really powerful method of scientific investigation uh, because they can help predict behavior, they can increase the understanding of a system, they can guide experimentation, um, and in clinical settings they can even be used to help clinicians um, make decisions about disease treatments. Uh, however, model building is a really labor-intensive process. It usually requires a great deal of expertise or experimental data. And even once a baseline model is built, it must be maintained as new information arises, or the model itself may need, even need to be extended to meet the user's needs. And one method that can make model building easier is the use of machine reading tools. Um, and, you know, Yasmin kind of covered machine readers can collect relevant papers from across the literature um, from a wide array of sources and collect relevant papers based on search query terms. And then from those papers, extract interactions between entities and then what we call these literature extracted events. Now, these entities are most often proteins, but they can also be genes, chemicals, or even biological interactions like apoptosis. And these LEEs are most often assembled in easy to read spreadsheets, kind of like a node edge list. However, the information uh, available in the literature is kind of extensive, um, not, and not every event extracted from a paper is relevant or even useful to the model at hand. Um, and machine readers also must do their best to account for the variability of, of language. Sometimes machine reader cannot accurately extract the interaction the author is trying to convey. A really common example of this is double negatives. Current methods of model building and extension have two major pitfalls. Either they address only one step of the process or they lack depth using a limited number of metrics to determine success or they cannot extend existing, existing models at all. To add information to a model, the whole model must be assembled from the beginning. Many tools also consider each step of the process, LEE assembly, baseline model creation, possible model extension as individual parts, and they kind of neglect the important relationships between these pieces of information and these model building steps. And this is where our tools come in. Uh, the three, three tools in our lab, flute, violin, and as you've already seen, clarinet, were each built to address one or more parts of the model building process. And together we hope to show that they build a good foundation for automated model extension. So first we have FLUTE, or the filter for understanding true events, and FLUTE addresses the veracity of machine reading output. FLUTE can take a set of LEEs and making use of expert curated public information databases can filter out those interactions which are not well documented or are just erroneous due to incorrect extraction. And the kind of central tool to today's talk is violin, uh, which is what I've developed, uh, which violin stands for verifying interactions of likely importance to the network. And what violin does is it takes a set of LEEs and a baseline model, which is also usually represented as a set of biological interactions, and violin automatically judges how those LEEs relate to the model. Each LEE is given a numerical score to represent its relationship to the model, and this score is based on four factors, which nodes of the LEE are also found in the model, the classification category of the LEE, 
the number of times an LEE occurs in a given machine reading output set, and we call that the uh, evidence score, and the confidence in extraction, or how certain we can be that the LEE has been extracted correctly. Within violin, there are four main classification categories. Corroborations, which agree with the model, extensions, which introduce new information, contradictions, which dispute some relationship represented in the model, and flagged, which are special LEEs that may or not be useful depending on the user's modeling goals. So they're kind of set aside for either manual inspection or just to be kind of taken out of the running for consideration. Within each of these classifications, violin also identifies subclassification, which can give a more detailed description of the relationship between an LEE and a model. For the purpose of this talk, since we're focusing on extensions, um, of, we'll go over the four subclassifications of extensions, hanging, internal, full, and specification. In a hanging extension, one entity from the LEE is already found in the model. And an internal extension, both entities from the LEE are found in the model, but the model does not already represent in a relationship between them. And a full extension, neither entity from the LEE is represented from the model, um, although one of the entities may be found in a hanging extension elsewhere in the LEE set. Finally, we have a specification, which is a type of extension which introduces new details to an existing model interaction. For instance, the LEE may provide the location of the interaction or it may provide the exact mechanism of the interaction between the two entities. And then finally, as you've already seen, we have clarinet. Uh, and clarinet takes a baseline model kind of repeating a little of Yasmin's talk, it takes a baseline model and a set of LEEs, and from that looks not at only at how the LEEs relate to the model, but how they relate to each other. And then from this, we get those uh, interpreted clusters, and then the user can use them to extend the base like model. So instead of having to consider the usefulness of an individual LEE, Clarinet considers the usefulness of groups of LEEs. Now, this tool integration occurred in two parts. We first investigated how flute and violin can be used in conjunction with each other using some of the benchmark data that was curated for violin's initial development. Next, we investigated the use of violin with clarinet for the purpose of extending a specific glioblastoma model. In total, we used four models of varying sizes representing four completely different biological systems. And then for each of those in total, we have 14 assembled LEE sets, ranging from just under 200 LEEs all the way up to over 25,000 LEEs, each of those LEEs representing a biological interaction. For the violin flute integration, we wanted to investigate three approaches. A control method, where an LEE set is classified with violin only. A pre-processing method, where, an, where the LEE set is filtered first with flute before being classified by violin. And then finally, a post-processing method, which is a more controlled filtering of specific LEE sets after they have already been classified by violin. And here's a summary of the LEE sets used for the violin flute integration. There's no need to remember all of this uh, information. What I want to highlight is how varied the query terms are and the range of sizes of the LEE sets. Some of these queries are long lists of proteins. Some of them are very narrow. Some of them are even taken from existing LEE sets, but removing um, all LEEs, which are not strictly protein-protein interactions. And then for our LEE set sizes, our smallest being 188, or 117, sorry, 117, and our largest being just over 6,000. And here we see just how many LEEs get filtered out if we pre-process an LEE set with flute. Each of these, you know, more than half of the LEEs are removed either because they're kind of too novel for experts to say, yes, this is a valid, very common interaction that should be there or it's uh, been removed because it's a machine reading error that just the LEE represented is not correct based on the literature and the science. But if we break down the LEE retention by category, we get some interesting results. 
We would expect a lot of extensions to be filtered out because these interactions are most likely to be novel and, cert, um, and thus kind of not validated to the point where experts are adding them to public databases. And also certain machine reading errors can cause false extensions. A common example is interactions involving pH. To a human reader, pH is a matter, measure of acidity and alkalinity. To a machine reader, it's pancreatic prohormone, a regulator of gastrointestinal function. <laughs> the results for the contradictions tell us something important as well. Uh, these LEEs dispute some interaction asserted in the model, and this dispute can be caused by a number of factors. The high filtration of this category suggests that many of these contradictions are in fact just machine reading errors. The corroborations tell us more about the model systems themselves. These systems are being modeled because they're not well understood, and so it makes sense that the corroborations would not yet be validated enough to be included in manually curated databases. And this is why we'd be interested in post-processing methods. If we're trying to, to create a new model instead of extending an existing one, we wouldn't want to filter out any corroborations. We would want those novel in the, that novel information to be included in the model building process. Uh, for extension, you may not want that so much. You want to make sure that you're, you're kind of adding things that are, are going to add to your model, not things that maybe aren't so well understood or um, may kind of muddy the waters. Okay, and here's what the evidence score distribution looks like for an unfiltered control versus the pre-process method for one of our LEE sets. As expected, LEEs with higher evidence scores are retained because they're more frequently found in the literature, which means they're more likely to be validated or commonly known um, or just well understood. And a majority of the LEEs which are filtered out have an evidence score of one. And this trend follows for our other 11 LEE sets. And again, this is what we would expect. Things that aren't very common, things that don't appear in the literature very frequently, they're either not well understood, not validated, maybe outdated information, uh, and so that they would be filtered out. From this, we can find multiple ways to use violin and flute to get useful and relevant LEEs. Pre-processing methods work as a type of feed forward, giving a cleaner LEE set for violin to judge. And post-processing methods work as feedback for violin, showing how machine readers propagate through violin's judgment, and also helping drive the user's choices. Post-processing methods can give a user information on how well-supported a biological system is in the literature, which can, of course, steer how they approach building or extending the model. We may even find more results if we dig a little deeper and see what the filtration scheme looks like for these subcategories of violin classification. This could help us make more informed decisions on violence automatic judgments. For example, if 90% of contradictions that contradict the direction of a biological interaction are filtered out all the time, maybe we can say that these direction contradictions are almost always a machine reading error and they can be put into a separate output of, you can probably ignore these. Now for the violin clarinet integration, we produce three sets of outputs, uh, well, three sets of inputs for clarinet for us to consider. The first being the control where clusters were generated from a raw LEE set that hadn't been filtered or judged in any way. A unique set where clusters were the interpreted clusters were generated um, from an LEE set where all of the duplicates were removed and extensions where clusters were generated from LEEs classified as extensions by violin. And here we have the information on the LEE sets of this study. Uh, the query terms are much more extensive and as such the number of LEEs is much higher, getting up into the tens and twenties of thousands. However, if we look at how these LEEs turn into our three outputs, um, in the, in the first reading set, RG1, the approximately 10,000 LEEs assembled contain only about 6,000 unique interactions. Similarly, the second larger set also reduces by almost 10,000 LEEs once we consider just those that are unique. If we further investigate into the extensions, we can see the breakdown of the subclassifications that I spoke about at the beginning of the presentation. 
For our RG1 set, a majority of extensions are connected to the original model network in some way, being either hanging or internal. Um, whereas in our RG2 set, a majority are full extensions, not connected to the model system in any direct way, though they may reach a model in a more indirect connection, which luckily Clarinet is built to identify. And here we have the interpreted extension clusters from each output, the top row being for our RG1 set and the bottom for our RG2. We found that not only did the cluster sizes change, which is to be expected because our LEE sets are getting smaller, um, but that the cluster proteins also changed. For RG2, our cluster proteins started out as TCR, AKT, and insulin, but by the time we get to just looking at the extensions, our, cluster, our clusters are centered around MEC and P38. And this input of sets moves towards an increasingly narrow focus, and these results can, can tell us what characteristics of an LEE set influence the interpreted clusters. From these results, we can conclude the control output from the raw LEE sets is influenced by corroborations and also by how many times an LEE has founded a set, which you may remember from violin is called the evidence score. And Yasmin spoke about this in her talk. Also from what we saw in the violin and flute integration, we can expect there to be a good number of machine reading errors influencing the candidate extent or the interpreted extension clusters. The next step is to take things even one step further and investigate what interpreted clusters we get if we only consider those extensions which are already connected to the model. Would they produce better clusters because we know that the LEEs would be relevant, or would the clusters be weaker because they're not extending the model as far outward? And that is a legitimate modeling goal. Sometimes the user doesn't want to create the largest system possible. They want to take a fixed set of entities and learn everything there is to know about how those entities interact. And that really is the main goal here, not to say this is the singular best way to extend a model or there's a one size fits all model extension pathway, but to say bring your, uh, but to say bring your modeling goal and we can tell you what way to use these tools in which to achieve it. And I think these results are very promising. Um, so very promising outcomes in that regard. These multiple approaches produce results that can be used for a variety of modeling goals. Um, even specifically a variety of different types of model extension. Our next steps would be to investigate all three tools together in a pipeline. Here we broke it down into two parts so that we didn't have to, we didn't have too many independent variables influencing the results, but the ultimate goal is to see how they would work all together. And with that, we would be able to see how the pre and post processing methods of flute affect the clarinet interpreted clusters and also determine the use cases where a user might want uh, to use the raw output or just the unique LEE sets to meet their modeling goals. Um, thank you for all of your attention. And I, of course, want to thank our funding without whom this work wouldn't be possible. Uh, a huge thank you to my co-authors. This project and these results were truly a collaborative effort. Um, and if you're interested in any of the tools I or even Yasmin presented today, you can find information on our lab's website, uh, which is posted here. And then if you're interested in using any of the tools, flute and clarinet are published and ready for use. I believe accordion is also published and ready for use. And violin will be live by the end of next week. So keep an eye out for that. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, we're a bit over time, but I think we have one minute for questions before we head to the social hour at Gather Town. So let us know if you have. You can unmute your microphone and ask directly or ask on the chat and I can transfer it. Yeah, hi, Casey. Um, uh, let me ask you kind of, it's kind of a broader question um, regarding this work. So there are many interaction um, databases, um, so publicly available resources. Um, uh, do you um, do you take advantage of those in this work? So this, what I'm thinking about are things like uh, protein interaction database or um, biogrid, uh, things like that. Um, yeah, so th those are kind of where um, where flute comes in is 
is Flute makes use of these databases and that's kind of how Flute validates interactions in an LEE set is it looks through them and says, um, Flute even has, has thresholding values where you can say, so long as this LEE is found in any one of these databases, uh, we're going to keep it or you can kind of have more stringent um, classifications where you say, okay, this has to be in multiple databases in order for us to to select this interaction for consideration. Oh, I see. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm, I may have uh, missed it when you said it the first time. Uh, so, so uh, by bringing in that information, then are you um, are you weighing those edges? So, because the different resources have you know different ways of curating that information, so, and and it also kind of goes to question of, okay, so once you bring in the interaction, does it matter to you whether it's protein, protein, or whether, you know, it involves some kind of other entity, chemical, or um, uh, I'm not sure, gene, let's say? Um, so, I'm sorry, I remember the first, the, I might answer these in, in reverse order. Um, so, as far as caring about what the ent, what type we, in violin, we call that the entity type, whether it's a gene or a protein or a biological um, process or a chemical. Um, and that is going to depend more on the user. Um, and that kind of, because when you're assembling these LEE sets, you can select strictly for protein-protein interactions, or you can go through the LEE set after it's been assembled and remove anything that isn't a protein-protein interaction set. Or uh, one of the co-authors on this paper, she's kind of doing a side project where she's looking at genes. So she wants to select for interactions that involve genes. Um, but that's kind of more in, in the, the LEE assembly part of, of the tool. So it's kind of the pipeline that gets put in. Um, it would be interesting if, if either Violent or Flute had, had a, um, an automatic selection for that to say, okay, we're going to score, we're going to judge these interactions lower because we know that we don't want to use a lot of, add a lot of genes to our model. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot the first half of your question. Um, it, it was about the different uh, input resources like BioGrid as to whether you, um, uh, you kind of consider them differently on, on oh, input. Yes. So, yeah. um, Sorry, yes. So that's part of, of um, Flute, and that kind of is into, you know, getting into the guts of the Flute algorithm, um, which I know that, that it uses each database differently. I couldn't tell you exactly how because um, Flute was developed by another one of our lab members. I do know that it does make different decisions based on which um, database. I just don't know to what extent. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it, it makes sense. I, I'm just trying to keep up with the musical instrument naming scheme. So it's, <laughs> um, sorry if I mixed up the tools a little bit. No, that's okay. Well, it is the Melody Lab, so yeah. it will make sense. All right, is there any last question before we head to the social hour at Gathertown? All right, I guess this concludes this session. Yes, please do head to the Gather Town if you have time.